A monumental move of a different kind. The latest on the half B billion dollar deal that's keeping the caps and the whiz in D.C. And monumental CEO Ted Leonce is speaking with news for today. After that announcement, his vision for a revamped arena. I'm Adam Tuss on the Patapsco River up close with the Dolly container ship that remains twisted in the wreckage of what was the key bridge. Coming up on News 4 tonight, we're going to tell you the plea that Maryland Governor Wes Moore just made, plus the response from the Army Corps of Engineers that is out here and what it's going to take to clean all this up and when this port could potentially be fully reopened. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. And we have video tonight, new video from Chopper 4 of the wreckage of the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse. Thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown. Our newscast streaming for you. I'm Jim Antley. And I'm Tommy McFly. It is Thursday, March 28th. And as you can see, the bridge looks virtually the same as it did when that cargo ship slammed into one pillar, causing the whole thing to crumble on Tuesday morning. But tonight, we bring you a new angle. Adam Tuss went out on the water earlier today and got a closer look at that damage. Headed out of the White Rocks Marina, not far from the crash site, we pull closer to the enormous wreckage. Yeah, well, getting up this close to the dolly, it really puts things in perspective. You can see normal sized boats out there. And then, of course, there is this massive container ship. You can see the key bridge, what was left of it, slicing through the front of that boat and the impact, it's almost tangible even two days later here. Structural engineers now check every piece of this tangled web of steel and concrete include the very edge of what's left of the key bridge. Huge cranes and equipment now being strategically positioned to clear the debris. This has turned into a salvage operation. Authorities with the sad news that the four remaining missing members of that construction crew that were on the bridge are likely in vehicles in the water trapped under steel and concrete and divers can't get to them. Because of the superstructure surrounding the vehicle, what we believe are the vehicles, and the amount of concrete and debris, divers are no longer able, able to safely navigate or operate around that. Maryland Governor Wes Moore has now made an initial $60 million request to the Biden administration for the mobilization, operation, and debris recovery from the collapse of the bridge. And he also wants financial help for the employees at the Port of Baltimore who may now be drifting without jobs. We have to make sure that our workers are protected. You know, when you're looking at the impact of the Port of Baltimore and what that bridge represents, we're talking about upwards of 8,000 workers. Uh, this is a core economic engine for our state. So many jagged steel pieces and now potentially hazardous materials a concern. There were 56 containers of hazardous materials on board the Dolly when it crashed. That comes out to 760 tons, and some of those containers are in the water. Mostly corrosives, flammables, uh, and some miscellaneous hazardous materials, class nine hazardous materials, which uh, would include lithium ion batteries. A huge sheen on the water now visible. Chopper 4 capturing these images for us today. The NTSB not responsible for that kind of cleanup, but says local authorities are aware. For now, that's the latest out here on the Patapsco River next to the Dolly. Adam Tuss, News 4, back to you. What a perspective he had mm -hmm. up that close. Hours after Governor Moore made that request for funds for recovery, the Biden administration did approve it. The $60 million in quick release emergency relief funds are a down payment on Maryland's initial cost for emergency repairs, design, and reconstruction of the bridge. And Jim, this evening, Governor Moore thanked the administration, and he also gave an update on rebuilding the bridge, saying that there's a long road ahead, but they're preparing for it. And when you have a chance to see that wreckage up close, you fully understand the enormity of the challenge. This is an incredibly complex job, and our timeline will be long. Governor Moore also spoke about the challenges those divers had been facing, saying the water is so dark and the debris is so dense, they often couldn't see more than a foot or two in front of their faces. Wow. He's calling those divers heroes. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Some of the brave officers who jumped into action the night of the bridge collapse also got some much deserved recognition today. They were honored at the Orioles game. Take a look. Their names are Sergeant Paul Pastoric, Corporal Jeremy Herbert, 
and Officer Gary Kurtz. They're officers with the Maryland Transportation Authority. They were joined on the field by Governor Moore and Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott. Governor Moore put out a statement today saying that these three officers define what it means to be Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. By the way, the O's also won their home opener today, so that's really nice to see. Very nice, some good news. Make sure you stay with us as we learn more and continue to cover this developing story on NBCWashington.com or download the NBC Washington app. Now for a look at some of the other stories we're following for you this evening. The person is, one person is hurt after a police shooting in District Heights. Prince George's County Police tell us it happened Thursday afternoon at Pennsylvania Avenue and Silver Hill Road in a shopping center parking lot. Police say this began when officers responded to a reported robbery. One person is dead and three others injured after you see fire broke out right here at the Claridge Tower Apartments at 12th and M Northwest today. It's a public housing building for senior citizens. The Red Cross tells News 4 more than a dozen families have been impacted by this fire. And fire officials say they're still working to determine exactly what caused that fire. Bills that would have established a state-regulated marketplace for recreational marijuana in Virginia and raise Virginia's minimum wage to $15 are dead for now. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin vetoed the marijuana measure, saying it endangers Virginians' health and safety. They would have set commercial standards and licensing requirements for large and small retailers to sell cannabis products. The minimum wage bill would have raised the state wage to $15 an hour by 2026. Montgomery County Police and Animal Control are searching for a coyote, saying it's attacked two women in Burtonsville today alone. This video of the coyote in the area was captured by a drone. Both women, you can see it right there, just be careful out there, both women are expected to recover and be all right. That's how it blends in mm -hmm. with the grass and weeds there. Gotta have a sharp eye to spot a yeah, coyote. Yeah, you do, and a sharp knife. One woman <laughs> took after it. All right, the Capitals and Wizards will be staying in D.C. for at least the next 26 years. Big win for Mayor Muriel Bowser and a big loss for Virginia Governor Yunkin. At Wednesday's announcement, Monumental CEO Ted Leonsis said he didn't want to talk about Virginia. And then he kind of talked about Virginia yeah. and what went wrong. Mark Seagraves has been following it all and joins us with more. In December, this was the scene as Ted Leonsis stood with Virginia officials to announce his plan to move the teams. But yesterday, a much different photo op as he stood with D.C.'s mayor and council members. As Ted likes to say, we're going to be together for a long time. <laughs> While it was all smiles at yesterday's announcement, Leonsis was pressed by reporters about what went wrong in Virginia to make him change his mind about leaving D.C. I only want to talk about D.C. I don't want to talk today about, you know, Virginia. But as reporters pressed, Leonsis made it clear. It's easier and better to do business in Washington, D.C. than it is to do in Virginia. <laughs> Virginia's kind of two states, you know, it's Richmond and Northern Virginia, and they, they need to, like, get together. Um, and, sorry. <laughs> I said I wasn't going to talk about Virginia. While it was clear the deal in Virginia hit a roadblock in the General Assembly, Leonsis gave Mayor Bowser much said, of the credit. D.C. did everything right from December on. And while Leonsis was critical of Virginia lawmakers, he was candid about how his team handled the process. We made tons of mistakes, but we managed to outcomes. And the outcome is exactly the right one. And our coverage continues with learning about what is in that half a B billion dollar deal that's going to keep the teams here until at least 2050. Yeah, it uh, provides for improvements to the aging arena and allows monumental sports to expand into the mostly vacant gallery place mall that's right next door. Mark spoke with Leonsis one on one after the announcement about his vision for a revamped arena. We could take this walkway here and connect it. We could now start to think about what could we do architecturally to make this area truly an entertainment community. It's also good for all of the businesses that surround uh, the arena. The deal signed by Bowser and Leonsis at center court before last night's Wizards game 
has the district providing $515 million over three years for construction costs, allows Leonsis to expand into 200,000 square feet in Gallery Place, including a new Wizards practice facility downtown, improved transportation options around the arena, a dedicated rideshare zone and drop-off for events, no streetery on 6th Street, and closing F Street two hours before events. Leonsa spoke with News 4 about his vision for a revamped Capital One Arena. In the bowl, I want to get better sound. I want to get better sight lines. We want to reestablish that there's more seats downstairs and less seats upstairs. That's, that's like a, what all the new arenas are doing. And we need new plumbing. Leonsis plans to do the construction on the arena in the off season so as not to disrupt the Caps and Wizards home games. So what we will be rehabbing the building will probably take a minimum of four years and it'll be in the summer. At Capital One Arena, the current and future home of the Caps and Wizards, Mark Seagraves. News 4. Thank you, Mark. You know, you don't think about the non-shiny things like plumbing, but that's I know, important too. Right? So yeah, it is. Glad that's on the punch mm -hmm. list. And Leonsis tells News 4 the passage of the new crime bill also was a factor in the decision, including the opportunity to have those drug-free zones declared around the arena. Be sure to stick with News 4 for the latest on this developing story. You can find the latest on NBCWashington.com and, of course, in our NBC Washington app. The Baltimore Orioles are starting this baseball season with a brand new owner. MLB owners unanimously approved the sale of the O's to a group led by David Rubenstein. So the group held a news conference this afternoon to officially announce that change in ownership. And Rubenstein, a Baltimore native and co-founder of a private equity firm, of course, a well-known philanthropist here in the D.C. area. Earlier this year, he agreed to buy the club from the Angelos family for more than $1.7 billion. He says... He knows how important the Orioles are to Baltimore. Baltimore has a closer relationship with its team, its baseball team, than I think any other city does in the country. The, the team really represents the character, the soul, uh, the grit, the personality of this city in a way that is not really true of any other baseball team and its city. And that's a good thing. Now, the last time the Orioles won the World Series back in 1983, and they took on the Angels this afternoon at home with a big win. Mm -hmm. That was nice. Glad to see that. Storybook yeah. opening to their season. Exactly. Still to come here on the News 4 Rundown, the future of D.C.'s iconic cherry blossom tree and social media star, Stumpy. Yes, <laughs> it's true that Stumpy's final peak bloom is upon us, but Maggie Moore, our digital producer, has a closer look about what is happening next. And making her story, how a local woman is taking her passion for wine and turning it into a business as the first female Indian winemaker in the U.S. <laughs> He's an icon. He's a legend. Uh -huh. He's a sensation. He's a D.C. celebrity. We are not talking about Jim Handley. Or Tom, oh, I thought you were talking about yourself. We're talking about third Stumpy, person. <laughs> the yeah. little cherry blossom tree on the southeast side of the Tidal Basin who has captured our hearts when he was, quote, unquote, discovered at the start of the pandemic. Boy, he's the, the tree that could, mm -hmm. right? Okay, while he may be... Lacking a bit in stature, he still gets those cherry blossoms every year during peak bloom. But this was Stumpy's last spring in D.C. He, like other trees along the Tidal Basin, will be removed by the National Park Service so they can repair the seawall and put a stop to all the flooding in that area. But there is hope for Stumpy's future. Digital producer Maggie Moore tells us Stumpy's legacy his legacy will continue. Uh -huh. Are you going to tell us now that they're going to do some I am Groot situation or they're going to save him or move him or transplant him? I know, right? He's just so determined to live in yes. spite of everything going against him. But unfortunately, uh, it's hard for trees in that area to live even when they're perfectly healthy. Mm. Uh, and it's hard to transplant trees even when they're perfectly healthy. And uh, Stumpy looks like that because he's, he's really not doing so hot. <laughs> oh. Um, Transplanting a tree is hard on its root system, and sometimes they can get what's called transplant shock. Uh, it's kind of like the shock that an organ transplant recipient okay. can get. Yeah. Okay. Um, and because Stumpy is already having such a hard time, if they try to move him, he would probably die in the process. Hmm. And then there's really no other options for what's right. going with Stumpy. There's no, there's no baby Groot if the tree dies. So 
Uh, Mike Latourse, the NPS spokesperson for the National Mall, told me that Stumpy is already in what arborists call the mortality spiral. Take a listen. You know, there is so little of that tree left to transplant. There is no interior trunk. Uh, people ask us, you know, how old uh, that tree is. You know, there literally aren't any rings for us left to count on the interior of the tree. It's basically just a bark framework, which is how the nutrients are transmitted to the branches um, and not much else that's left. Hmm. But Maggie, this isn't the end for Stumpy. What comes next? So the other trees are just going to become mulch. It's very circle of life. They're gonna nurture, yeah. they're gonna nurture the future trees Aww. that get replanted after the seawall is rebuilt. But the NPS knows how much the district loves Stumpy. So his best shot at a future is for the tree experts at the U.S. National Arboretum to take clippings from him before he's removed. And I spoke with one of the horticulturists involved with that process, uh, Piper Zatel, and she walked me through the process of turning those clippings into Stumpy clones. Hmm. Ah. We can't save the original Stumpy tree. We will do our best um, and do the next best thing, which is to vegetatively propagate or clone Stumpy. My colleagues and I will go down to the tidal basin and we'll probably go um, collect material a couple times between now and May. And what we're looking for is new vegetative growth that appears on the tips of the branches in the spring, typically after the tree has concluded its flowering. And what we'll do is we'll collect something like what you see here. So we'll prepare the cutting to be stuck into the flat, into the medium. So this is similar to the setup that we will use for Stumpy. We'll of course label, document our material, that's very important. And then we'll repeat the process until the material runs out. Going from this flat here to a pot for cherry trees will take about a year, provided that they root for us. Once they're ready, they'll go into their own individual pots, and as they grow, we'll step them up into larger pots. Plant people are wild. Yeah. They're spending yeah. a lot of time and a lot of care on that. Yeah. They really are. Uh, I've propagated a few succulents in my time, but nothing to that degree. Uh, and this is an important project that yes. matters to a lot of people. Yeah. Of national Huge. importance. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> how long will it take for us to get little stumpies at the tidal basin? So uh, nature is unpredictable. There's no guarantees uh, that those clippings will form roots. But to get the best shot, the Arboretum is sending some of those clippings to a satellite research station in Tennessee. Two places, lots of clippings, means more chances for success. And okay. assuming that those clippings do form roots, uh, the Seawall Project, if it stays on track, they're going to coordinate with them, make sure that they can put the trees in the ground when it will not be flooding anymore. Right. Uh, and that should take between two and five years for the trees to get into the ground and start producing flowers again. Wow. Uh, and okay. then one other thing to know is that even if and when those Stumpy 2.0s are planted, they're genetically the same as the Stumpy we know and love, but they are not going to look the same as him. Um, the goal of the project is to produce healthy, beautiful trees yeah. that uh, are a wonderful experience for everyone. Uh -huh. And Stumpy is not healthy, so he, he had a brief life and a brief time with yes. us. And uh, future wrong. trees, yeah, future trees will be healthier, which is great for them, right. but we should appreciate Stumpy while we I have love them. Stumpy on steroids. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. We, we will love that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Don't be sad that it's over. Be glad that it happened. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> great stuff. Boy, what an education this has been for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Maggie, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anytime. Always great to see you. More of Maggie's reporting, too, on the NBC Washington TikTok. We call her TikTok Maggie. And our Instagram Reels as well for all of these really great reports that are super fun and something we didn't really know we needed a big deep, deep dive on until you gave it to us. So thank you, Maggie. The full story on Stumpy. Everybody yes. loves Stumpy. All right. <laughs> when we come right back on the News 4 Rundown, speaking of great stories, Tommy's got one on the Kite Festival. Quite a preview. I'll explain why you're seeing Latin on your screen. And the festival is taking place this weekend. I sat down with this local kite maker for some tips. Next. Welcome back to the News 4 Rundown. A Virginia woman is paving the way in the wine industry. She actually started out with another career entirely, but turned her new knowledge and passion into something award-worthy and uh, delicious at the same time. Mm -hmm. This woman's Her Story Month. Melissa Malay introduces us to the owner of the first Indian-owned winery in the U.S.
Meet Suda Patil, owner of Narmada Winery in Amosville, Virginia. Opened in 2009, it was the first Indian-owned winery in the country, making Suda the first female Indian winemaker in the U.S. I wasn't even thinking of being first at anything, really. This was a passion we had for wine. Narmada named for her mother-in-law. Because she sacrificed a lot for us to come to this country for education. It's also the name of a famous river in India. But the gorgeous winery wasn't always in Suda's plan. This journey started in 1968 when she met her husband, Pandit. He was on break from studying in the U.S. He said, as soon as I finish my Ph.D., I will send you to college also. So I told him if he was willing, then it'll be a go, kind of, you know. Well, you and your husband ended up with a beautiful love story. Yes, it did. You know, we got married within 10 days. They moved here where a host family helped teach Suda English. He was always behind me. And my mom from India was always behind me. The couple had two children. Once they were in middle and high school, Suda decided it was time for her to go back to class. A chemistry degree from George Mason, dental school at Georgetown, and a master's in endodontics at the University of Maryland. She ran her McLean practice for 20 years, opened another in Culpeper, then the wine bug hit. We started our vineyard two acres, and we were tending to it from on the weekends. As their passion grew, their vision expanded, and Pandit continued to encourage her. He said, it's okay. You want to try it? Go ahead and try it. Suda took classes, studied, tasted, and tested, and turned herself into one of the most award-winning winemakers in the country. We probably won over 900 awards altogether, over 150 maybe at this point, gold medals. Their two acres, now 20. Pandit passed in 2018, but their dream lives on. And he was always so proud of me. He always talked about me. I'm not the winemaker. It's my wife who does that part. She's the chemistry person. Good for her. Mm -hmm. Now I want a glass of wine. <laughs> Finally tonight, one of the best sights to see on the National Mall is this very weekend. We're talking about the Kite Festival. Don't have your wine until you fly the kite. No. So it fills the skies all over the Washington Monument. Beautiful colors. Everyone's checking it out on the grounds and lots of smiling people. But there are going to be fancy kites. There's also <laughs> an opportunity to make your own kite. And I caught up with a kite making master to learn how to make a kite as something as simple as a trash bag here in the scene. You have a string and a kite way up there, and you know you're you're connected. You're connected some, to something higher, maybe. Paydays and Terra, feet on the ground, men's in Kalo, mind in the sky. Val, you might be the first person who's ever used Latin on the scene, so thank you for that. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Val Deal from Kensington has been kiting since 1970. I won the award for funniest kite at the Smithsonian Kite Festival, which is now the Blossom Festival. He now works for the Premier Kite Company. The thing that I'd like to convey to everybody is that kites are very simple to fly. Try it for yourself Saturday on the National Mall. Don't have a kite? Maybe try to build yeah, one at home. Yeah. This is a quintessential diamond kite. Historically speaking, would this be like the Ben Franklin key kite? Kind of, yeah, okay. it's a diamond kite or hmm. Malay, they call it. Using household items, trash bag, duct tape, wire, strings, sticks, we got to work. Template, symmetry. Cut the sail. Your poles. Tape the poles in. Uh, you bow it. Reinforce, and then we're gonna bridle. You can meet Val at the festival. He'll be in the kite hospital. Yeah, I'm healing <laughs> now in my old age. Um, no, the, uh, the kite doctor is a lot of fun. We put a sign up that says pre-existing conditions accepted. <laughs> you know? And so if you bring a kite and it's all broken up, we'll do our best to get it flying. And I, I really, really enjoy that. All right, we were gonna fly these outside on our plaza, but it's dark, so we're gonna do it inside. Right. Now, what I learned from the kite master, yeah. Maggie, mm -hmm. Jim, if when I drop it, you pull as fast as you can, reel it in, reel it in, reel it in. If it's a good kite, it will catch the air and it will sail a little bit. Okay. All right. So, ladies first. We're going to go with Maggie oh, yeah. first. I'm going to watch closely. All right. Yeah. Take out a little bit of the slack, and I'm going to drop it on three. Ready? Okay. One, two, three. Nice. Kind of. Oh, yeah. Right. That yeah, was very good. Foot, honestly. There, that was <laughs> no, good. Thanks. Handley, you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. When was the last time you were this stressed on television? I'm pretty stressed. <laughs> I need to 
<laughs> Stretch it out. Squats. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. Here we go. You ready? Yes. Three, two, one. You kind of, kind of. You got kinda. it. That works. I don't know. Kind of a limp ending there. I don't know. Could have poked an eye out, though. You made this one. I made that one. That's the good Very one. Very good. All right. Yeah. Because I use spare no it. expense. That's because true. this is a garbage bag. Exactly. But it's a clean garbage bag. I didn't it's, go and use the recyclable no, garbage bag exactly. or the garbage bag from the uh -huh. uh, kitchen. And uh -huh. there we go. All so right, good with stuff. that, with that, we will fly into the rest of the night. Saturday is going to be big. Mm -hmm. It is so impressive down there. Even if you Beautiful. just drive by. Yep. But don't try to fly a kite unless you know what you're doing. Because they're some heavy hitters, right? Yep. We're going to go fly a kite now. Thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown. I'm Tommy McFly. And I'm Jim Hanley. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Have a great night, everybody. And she's TikTok Maggie. Exactly. Right here. <laughs>